good morning, uh, good midnight, wherever you're at in the world. Thanks for joining us. This is, I believe, the last session uh, for the Smart Region as part of the ASU Winter Games. It's been three days of, of fun, excitement, joy, uh, getting to, to participate with so many dreamers and doers from around the world. This has been such an exciting experience, and we want to thank you for participating in what I think might be the most exciting panel of the day because we get to lock hands and have a fun conversation with some of our fellow uh, colleagues around the world that are driving smart region efforts. And we actually get to have a free flowing conversation about what partnership uh, in the future might look like. And so you, I think you're gonna see us uh, really just um, kind of con converse back and forth and, and see where we go. So this is gonna be really exciting. So um, I'm gonna go around the, the Brady Bunch circle of Zoom and have my colleagues introduce themselves based on kind of where they are in my screen. Uh, and we'll start with you, Di, because you're my top left. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and thank you to our panelists who are up at midnight and 2 a.m. We are exceedingly grateful for you doing this. Um, I think it also says a lot about the importance of this panel. So I feel like I've run a, literally participated in some sort of multi like event Olympic thing. Um, and this is the closing event for me. And this is really exciting that we're talking about the rise of the regions as our very last event, because I can't think of a more important way to go out given so much of the conversation over the last three days, we've talked about partnerships, learning from each other, how to share um, these lessons and how to leverage the expertise across different jurisdictions. Um, so I'm really excited to see where this discussion goes and really grateful for everybody for being here. Thank you. Awesome, yeah, and you really wanna feel the, the sense of collaboration on this panel. The next two people, as I introduce you, please tell us uh, what time it is, it, it, where you're located. So Philip, to you next. Thank you so much, uh, Dominic, Diane, and, and the entire panel for actually inviting us to have this conversation. My name is Philip uh, Tigo. I'm Senior Director for Africa for Thunderbird School uh, of Global Management, which of course is part of Arizona University. Uh, so it's 2 a.m. and I'm in Nairobi, Kenya, <laughs> in East Africa. Uh, no, of course, super excited. Uh, we started, I think, to have a conversation with Diane and our team actually a year ago in Davos. Uh, and the idea was to think through um, how do how can we get cities to leverage uh, technology innovation, but also how can technology innovation bring new ideas around how cities can be reconfigured because uh, a lot of our cities are have run out of the imagination. Uh, and, and where is the space of universities and academia, but also where is the state, space of multi stakeholders? Uh, because we, we can't do this alone. Uh, so yeah, so happy to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Awesome, thanks for joining us and thanks for staying awake. Raphael, over to you. So, uh, good night for, uh, to all of you. I'm, uh, it's one uh, midnight here uh, in Italy. I am uh, in Brescia, which is close to Milan. And uh, uh, where I have been, I had worked for the last 20 years in uh, for the province of Brescia. I was in charge of uh, um, innovative innovation and uh, the government services. Then recently, almost two years ago, I moved to the city of Rome for a new experience of managing uh, the digital uh, transformation department for uh, the capital. So it's a very interesting uh, experience and I like to share uh, and to be with all of you. So thank you so much, Diana and Dominic for the invitation. Of course, thanks for joining us. We're, we're happy to have both of you here. Uh, and again, thanks for staying awake. Really appreciate it. Jen. Hey, everybody. Um, my name is Jen Sanders. I'm the executive director of the Dallas Innovation Alliance and recently the North Texas Innovation Alliance. So we're a nonprofit public-private partnership that's really focused on how do we bring best minds to the table in an independent way um, to be able to support the city of Dallas and now the DFW North Texas region and creating smart, connected, and resilient um, entities, right? And I love on this panel that we have representatives from each of the sectors that I think all of us work with. So having the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, the academic sector are examples of all the pieces that we really all need. And I love seeing everybody on this call and certainly um, Dom and Brian and I have worked together for years as we've kind of been feeling this out together and just really thrilled to take a, go from local, regional, state, national, global. So everybody here, I think we uh, we keep the ball rolling. Yep, this is perfect. I think 
this could be the beginning of this again this this widening of the circle and really thinking global and going global with our partnerships it's fantastic brian last but not least on the panel hi everyone and good afternoon to those of you that are local um and you know thank you to the rest of you that are joining us and staying up late i have a, a call tomorrow morning at about that two o'clock in the morning time so I'll kind of draw some inspiration from you guys and, and see how you handle it here. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, as Don mentioned, my name is Brian Dean. I am the program manager for what we call the Connective, which is our Greater Phoenix Smart Region Consortium Group. Uh, and it does, you know, it's a formalized public-private partnership, which brings together our 23 local government organizations, uh, along with the academic partners like ASU and the Community College District and our regional planning and economic development partners, such as the ACA with Dominic, we have Greater Phoenix Economic Council, and then some of the other private uh, technology industry providers uh, or solutions providers as well, all to really kind of start to build that collaborative innovation ecosystem where we can all kind of safely and, and you know, collaboratively work together uh, to de co-develop these solutions that will be that foundation for building a smart region across our jurisdictional boundaries here. So super excited for the conversation. Uh, great to see a lot of uh, friendly and familiar faces and yeah. Let's Here we go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, and I, I always forget to mention this, but for those of you on the, the outside platform, please don't uh, hesitate to send questions in to us. I am monitoring that as we speak, uh, and we'll be bringing those questions to our panelists. But I think what's going to be exciting you're going to see here is we purposely didn't draft up a script uh, for this conversation because we wanted to be so free flowing, so open, so honest, uh, and really see where this can take us today. And so what I thought I would do is go around again and ask everyone kind of what they're working on currently, maybe some future projects in the next year that is 2021. And then once we hear kind of the ideas of what people are currently working on, then the next segment of the conversation will really be towards ideas for future collaborations, right? Because once we understand kind of everything that everyone's working on, then we can start to brainstorm and ideate around where the future collaborations may lie. And so Raphael, if you don't mind, I'm going to turn to you first, you know, what are some current projects that the city of Rome is working on or that, you know, the broader um, collaboration around the regional effort is working on today and in the future? Yes, I, uh, during the last uh, couple of years, we have started to move from the activity of uh, modernizing the information system of the city, like, which for us was a sort of more traditional, let me say, activity. And we move more um, towards uh, the, um, the real digital transformation processes. And to do this, we had launched some initiative that for us could help all the other departments that they were developing their own projects to, um, to have something that um, through which they could be connected. So mm -hmm. the, the goal was to avoid the development of isolated projects, but to try to develop a sort of um, uh, transversal infrastructure that could be uh, support the development of the of the other uh, activity in the, the in their application domains. And just to give you some example, we are um, we are working on a, a rewarding platform we call the Citizen Wallet. So the idea is to uh, to be able to detect uh, any kind of transition uh, during the city for citizens and to give them uh, credits so that they can also spend in uh, another kind of services that of course are provided by other public or private uh, partners. So we have started to give credits for uh, people that are using, uh, especially in the last year, online services and the idea is to allow citizens, for example, to convert in these credits for, a redu for reduction in uh, to access, for example, buses, public transportation, or uh, events in the city for uh, initiative done by our in-house company for tourism development. And step by step, we are trying to enlarge the, the group of partners uh, that can share these kind of things. Then another initiative is um, what we call a smart square. So the idea was to, uh, to enrich the, the action of uh, restoration of the squares and put some devices in the square 
uh, such as uh, a screen or uh, a Wi-Fi connection or a bench uh, or, uh, or a gym uh, to uh, enable an, uh, the interaction of citizens of that suburb with uh, digital services. And, uh, and what we are trying to do is also to develop this initiative in a private public partnerships, which means that the investment uh, is done by the private. We try to build a sort of concession. So the idea is to have 15 squares in the city, all managed by this um, private um, consortium uh, for uh, around eight to 10 years. And uh, we are also trying to support, for example, a national TV to broadcast uh, um, information in the, in, the, in, the, in the screen and also the local uh, football team to provide historical uh, movie, historical, uh, yes, um, trailer or movies on, uh, on the screen. So the idea is to try to help them to attract uh, potential uh, customers to, to find the balance in terms of uh, new revenues uh, to, to allow the, the return on investment of the private uh, um, uh, player. And uh, on the other side, I'd like to mention that we are trying to work on, also on the, on the strategy of the city. So the idea is to, uh, to develop a smart city plan, a smart, a Rome Smart City, it's named, it's a program for uh, uh, where we are trying to describe which could which should be for us the city in the, in the next ten years, and how to define the the approach to try to reach the goal in a, in each domain. And uh, we have also mapped existing projects and try to identify the the distance of these projects among the the uh, the, ba the basic uh, building blocks that we have defined for. Uh, for a city development. And this should allow to start from practical initiative and step by step in a coherent way, try to move to the, to the vision that we have been describing. And we think it, this is important because we need to increase the awareness of our administrators in terms of vision and to find the balance between uh, uh, practical uh, and real initiative projects, but also with something that which is not, let's say, short-term uh, oriented, but in, more uh, in a mid or long-term uh, uh, perspective. Mm. And uh, this is not easy, as you can imagine, not, not only for administrators, but also for managers. But I think we all think that this, the right balance should be uh, very useful for uh, um, Putting step-by-step uh, step, uh, in the same direction of all, uh, all the investment, all the initiative. So this is something that we are doing so far, and uh, we are also trying to involve in this process some of the small municipality around the city. Uh, this is something new for the capital. Uh, actually, it was I was much more uh, used to do it uh, when I was working in, in, in Brescia because that was a province. But here also in Rome now we are trying to um, to aggregate together all the small municipality, for example, for the um, uh, payment system to the public sector. So we have to develop a platform supported by the national government and we are trying to deploy the use of this platform also to the small uh, municipality because as you know typically they, they do not have skills or resources so it's a, it's a way to facilitate their um, their participation on this kind of of projects completely that congratulations on all the fantastic work that you're helping to lead in Rome in the surrounding region I love some of those themes you know you talk about this transversal infrastructure internally. But I mean, that's exactly what you commented on at the very end, trying to build that infrastructure externally between the municipalities and between the surrounding jurisdictions. And I think that's something that's gonna be a, a really common three theme uh, from all of us here. And so I think that's something uh, we can build on. And this idea of, I love the idea that you're working on a smart city strategy and plan to, in order to increase awareness. I think that's something that we wanna keep in the back of our mind as we look towards future collaborations between us all is 
how do we plan and how do we build awareness? Because I think that's something that's going to be critical here moving forward. Um, so Philip, uh, talk to us about some of the things that you're helping to lead that you mentioned kind of in the, in the pre-call just a couple of minutes ago. That was very exciting to hear. Neverland, this is my first Zoom call for the year. <laughs> uh, and it's 2 a.m., sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, play, I'll play that card. Uh, <laughs> no, I think, I, I think on, on, on this particular context, um, of course, we were quite inspired by the collective uh, because we, uh, about a year and a half ago, we were thinking of uh, how do you leverage on new technologies so that those new technologies can actually have what we call five, five outputs that can not necessarily look at, um, especially the African continent, frogging around smart cities uh, and understanding that um, the only template that we share across the continent is a global goals, right? And so if you look at goal 11 and thinking about populations of the future will be in cities for a continent whose median age is about 19.1 and who are predominantly city-based um, populations, then how do you ensure that the cities of the future uh, are built in a way that are more resilient. Uh, I think somebody in the call mentioned that. So a couple of things we're looking at, yes, of course, we're looking at a young demography, but also we do not have time based on the challenges of cities, right? So it means you must leverage on technology. So how do you use technology for planning, design and delivery and all that stuff, uh, but also ensuring that even in the building, then you're doing it in a, in a way that you're not harming the planet, right? So something that you're doing within the planetary boundary. So of course, climate change becomes an issue there. An issue of new business models and opportunities because then you're bringing about uh, issues that can handle rapid urbanization. Of course, you're looking at new business models. And I think Dai and a couple of colleagues are, uh, in ASU wrote this whole uh, piece around agile governance. And I think we need that. But then how do you scale that so that it's not only a purview of one country, but many countries can use that. We're also looking at new financial instruments because we're talking about uh, rapid urbanization or development that you need a way that you can attract different kinds of investments across uh, a model of a smart region because then it's just not about buildings it's many things uh, and then of course <clears throat> new engagement borders I know one of our colleagues talked about inclusivity so how do you do this in a way that is participatory and citizens can engage but also what you're doing is responsive and not a, and 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 kind of not repeating the legacy challenges we've had around, whether it's urban uh, slum upgrading, etc. Et so that's basically what we are working on uh, in terms of those five key points. Uh, but then understanding that uh, we're in a global village. And so we look at Africa basically as a body. Uh, so each, each part, each part must, must function in a way that it specializes. So we need a heart that knows how to how to do what heart does. We need a brain that does what a brain does, what a lung does. So we've identified a couple of countries. Uh, so Kenya, uh, there's something called Konzatektopolis. It's one of our smart cities, but then we are thinking that uh, within the basis of Africa. So Africa is a smart region, Konza uh, being a center for IoT, right? Uh, then we go west to Senegal. I know all of you have heard of Econ City. So Acon City is part of our conversation and they are looking at, or we are looking at that being a center for excellence for creative economy. So how do you, how do, you do creativity around smart cities? We're going into Niger uh, not all countries are created equal. Mm. You cannot do a smart city in Niger, but they think they can do a smart village because that's where they are. So how do you then use that context to do a smart village? Then we go right to Rwanda. I don't have to mention that, right? It's to the extent. So, so that's really our model. And then, of course, looking at Macedonia, uh, who well, one of our colleagues is doing something about it, because then we have also to see how what is the place of this smart region of Africa in the world. Mm -hmm. And so then, how do you also then collaborate with with with, with, with the connected uh, in Phoenix, uh, understanding that that's a model that is is pretty much mature, uh, and and so we do not need to recreate. Uh, stuff uh, we can learn and share and knowledge across. So, so, so that broadly, I think, is is is, is what we're working on uh, in this context. That's phenomenal, and you, you hit on so many, I think, really key points that we really drove home when we first started the connective. And I think you're really speaking Brian Dean's uh, language there when we talk about <laughs> centers of excellence. He uh, he loves uh, that topic, so I think you two might have to connect on the side. But I love this idea. It's because you know, and this this is what we're really trying to get at with this panel. Uh, or this collaboration is that we're all regions. We all can learn from each other. We don't need to all spend our limited resources recreating the wheel when we can just learn from each other, right? It's, it's that network um, uh, idea where each node in the network you add, that network becomes stronger. 
right? So if we can add more nodes, more regions in this network, we're all going to become stronger. So great points, Philip. I really appreciate it. Jen, turning to Dallas, talk to us. You know, you just went from kind of a, a, a city to a regional approach, or you have both approaches going on at the same time now. One, talk to us about how was that transition, getting that up and off the ground in the last, you know, six months or so, you know, it's challenges that you face. And then, of course, you know, what are some of the key things you're working on uh, today? No, for sure. And I just feel like I should say ditto to everything everyone is saying. We're also in sync, which is amazing. And I think the the theme of, you know, to this point of not recreating the wheel, but we always say, and I think one of the things I've been most impressed with being in this space compared to other industries I've been in is everyone is so willing to say, this is what didn't work. This is what failed. Please don't do this. You know, everyone wants everyone else to succeed. And I always I always say, you know, we were able to move real fast in Dallas, you know, with the living lab and pulling all this together. I said, I want whoever's coming after us to go faster. I have no pride of ownership. I have no pride of that speed. You know, I want, don't make the same mistakes, move fast and then tell us how that worked, you know? And so I think that's so, it's such an important lesson and that's been so encouraging in this space specifically. So that just is a preference. But when, um, when we founded the DIA in 2015, the whole concept was really how do we move faster? You know, how do we take the risk off of the public sector and be able to do what we need to do so they are empowered to know how to best spend the resources? So, um, you know, when we got started and, and talked to the mayor, we said, you know, we understand that the, your, the use of public funds, you have to be extraordinarily risk averse. We are by nature looking to be entrepreneurial. We're willing to take that on if it works y'all did it. If it doesn't work, I'm going to fall on that sword. And that was real attractive. That's a really attractive prospect for a municipality or for the public sector in general, and understandably so. So, you know, we were, you know, it's always about prioritizing what is the problem you're trying to solve first? You know, how do we get alignment around that? This is important to all of us, no matter what the sector. Let's get on the same page because, you know, complaints that we've heard and mistakes that, you know, we've all learned from each other on is, you get distracted by a shiny object, you're trying to fit a solution into a problem. And that um, that rarely, if ever, is successful. And so, you know, we really look to how do we move toward integrated mm -hmm. solutions and projects through this concept of these projects shouldn't be implemented in a vacuum. It's great to know that these light controls work, but if you're not looking at that data combined with public safety measures and sensors related to that, we're not really getting the full value of these investments. And so that was something really important to us in that first stage. And then I think as, you know, the idea was always to go regional and how critical that is. And we talked about, I think on the prep call in DFW, 30%, almost 40% of residents cross one county line at least once a day. And so when you think about that, you need the systems to work, you need emergency response, traffic congestion, all of these pieces, it's always been a critical element and certainly no more obviously than this year. And so over the last year working on the regional initiative, it really became about what were our priorities at the beginning of the year? What happened in March? You know, what had what took precedent? What problems emerged that we didn't really know existed or didn't know were so prevalent? And then coming out of this towards the end of the year, what do we want to carry forward from that? We learned to move faster together. Interlocal agreements got done faster. You know, governments were more agile. We all came together around issues like the digital divide. How can we find ways to not? Kind of regress from a process standpoint or from a timeline standpoint and again just to reiterate the financial modeling right you know there's less there's going to be less funds than ever but we've had too little funds and too few people for decades you know and so um, i think that there's there's a real opportunity moving forward and i think the things that we've landed on to focus on in the next year are similar to to what we all are you know one being digital inclusion and access to broadband looking at that infrastructure. And what we found already is, you know, that speaking of the village to the city concept, some of our smallest towns that are our members have done amazing things that the big cities haven't necessarily done yet. And so when we think about making sure it's really clear the applications, regardless of size, are absolutely relevant um, is, is so important. Um, and then I guess the, the last thing I'll say, just because we're I'm really excited it's coming to fruition, but we've been working on this concept of a smart park, you know, within our living lab and literally turning in, in a parking lot back into a park and that's about to launch. But the whole concept there is one, what is a smart park, right? You know, so we, you know, define that as smart resources, smart operations, smart experiences. 
And so how do you look at a, a net zero from a resource perspective, make it easier on the city, but how do you create these kind of delightful experiences that keep people coming back and it's something new and engaging. And we have this rotating innovation arcade where we're gonna have temporary installations of new technology, new experiences, startups and large corporations to be able to kind of mix it up and have there be an education component to what's next and, and everything that comes along with that. So that's a one-off, but definitely this year, the, the, the conversation around how do you solve for digital inclusion, how do you pay for it, um, has been a, a, a massive uh, lift for this year. Oh, exactly. I think all of us are, are facing that and we're in that together. So excited to see how we can share. And I think that that may be a common theme as I was taking notes of what you were saying. It's this idea uh, of But I remember listening to Jimmy Choi, who's uh, kind of, I think, a senior vice president at ASU over entrepreneurship. And she said, the best entrepreneurs steal like thieves, right? If there's a good idea out there, use it, right? Don't recreate the wheel, whether it's a big city, a small city, if there's a good idea, steal it, right? Because then you can, you can build on it. So great point. So now we've heard uh, from Nairobi, Rome, Italy, Dallas, Texas. Now, Brian, in our backyard, we get to hear from you. What's, uh, what's Phoenix up to? What's the connective up to in this greater Phoenix region? Yeah, no, and just like all the rest of you guys said, I, I would have to echo your guys' sentiments of, of ditto, right? We are, you know, we're all about kind of collaboration and, and bringing all of our communities along together, kind of regardless of size, regardless of resources, um, you know, almost even regardless of kind of priorities <laughs> at, to a point. Um, but so we, over the last year, we've really focused on the, from the connective side to kind of create those pathways to success, right? So we brought everyone together. Um, and then everyone agrees that we need to work together. There's challenges that we all face that can't be solved in these, these silos or within one community. <clears throat> but how do we do that? You know, there's so many kind of barriers to that collaboration. Um, so at the beginning, once we launched the Connective in late November or late 2019, uh, we spent the very the first kind of quarter of 2020 before COVID hit, really just aligning on what are those challenges? What's keeping us from being able to work together to solve these challenges? And how can the connective or this outside organization and the partner network that we've cultivated start to break down those, those barriers? Um, and so we've worked quite a bit on creating that kind of foundational framework uh, or operational framework to actually advance things going forward, go faster, uh, like Jen mentioned. Um, and so we, we had some successes in implementing a, you know, a region-wide collaboration platform that helps, helps our cities uh, collectively identify challenges and identify potential solutions. Um, and evaluate them all together. You know, it's one, one big platform that they're able to get into and, and kind of discuss and, and talk about and figure out, hey, yeah, I want to, City of Chandler wants to, wants to take this on with City of Scottsdale or, or Glendale, et cetera. Um, and we'll work together, kind of record our, our, our findings and everything, and then we can expand that, you know, out to the rest of the network. So it's all about that kind of collaborative co-development and then scaling and learning from each other. Um, and then on top of that is, okay, what are the other, how can we connect our current assets that we have in different communities? Uh, you know, test tracks up in Anthem, uh, the I-10 kind of mobility and mobility corridor between Tucson and Phoenix. Um, you know, so many of the, the Sky Song facility in Scottsdale. How can we use these things to start to invigorate innovation going forward and put some pro programmatic uh, kind of tie-ins together that bring in, you know, the academic sector uh, the educational side uh, to where we can really make these sustainable changes um, and, and scalable and replicable changes across our, our community. So, you know, that's, we, we spent the last year really, I mean, COVID was a little bit of a blessing in disguise operationally uh, for me because we were able to identify our challenges. And then, you know, I kind of got to figure out how we've all put it together. Um, and then now we're, I'm super excited for 2021 because we have kind of this pipeline along with the pathways to success, like I mentioned, uh, built so that we can actually implement some of these these projects going forward. So, you know, working on some digital equity point, um, proof of concept projects, um, some mobility projects and traffic management projects. Um, and then a uh, big thing that I'm super excited about is the data and kind of regional metrics and KPIs development that we're working with ASU and a few of our partners on um, to really create this shared dashboard of, of metrics so we can measure the successes and our, our goals um, uh, associated with those, those challenges that we identified before. So that's, you know, I'm super excited about that. I know a lot of times I heard in another 
panel that uh, standards are, are kind of only useful for deployment. I agree to a point. I also think that they can be very, very helpful in identifying what those strategies should be and those, those gaps essentially that we have uh, in our communities and start to you know, kind of align and, and point resources, the very limited resources that are, we have uh, in the right directions uh, and, and go forward as, as necessary. So yeah, super excited about that and, and super excited to share and learn uh, <laughs> as we go with everyone. So I have to say as well, laughing watching Jen's face when you're talking about standards and she's like, no, I think I found a fellow standards geek. I'm so excited <laughs> about this. Jen, I didn't know this. Oh, get ready. I had a whole I had a <laughs> long conversation about data standards and interlocal and how we're fixing the agency cross. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Okay, next time we've got a happy hour together, that's where we're going. Um, but while you were talking a little bit earlier, we did have a chat question come in. And I think it resonates across all of these regions. And the question was, how do you go about cultivating the political support to get these things up and running? And how do you mitigate realistically that political risk? So maybe we'll start with you, Jen, but I'd love to hear a response from everybody because I think this is something that everybody here on this panel has had to deal with and probably run into slightly different challenges each and every time. Yeah, happy to. So when I was um, when I was getting started playing in the DIA, um, there's an initiative called Pecan Street in Austin, Texas, some of you are probably familiar with, but it was also a nonprofit that came out of UT around creating the largest smart grid um, demonstration project. And so anyway, speaking with with one of the early starters there, I said, what do I need to know first? And he said, you need a champion at the top, you need a champion at the bottom, and then you fill in the gaps. And so you know, looking at who who's going to drive it um, vocally, who can help um, provide you know the um, the bandwidth and say we want you to spend your time on this. You know, whether it's assistant city manager, director level, or whatnot. Um, but I think collating everyone around a north star wasn't as tricky as I was concerned that it might be because I think we we all do want the same things ultimately, and if we can make sure that that the story and the work that we're doing is directly pointed toward that and that connection is always extraordinarily clear. I think that you can mitigate a lot of um, a lot of the challenges that get into play, but I know something that, and that's why I think staff um, is, is so important as well as elected officials because we know the election cycles is where priorities change. And so I think that through line of independent organizations like the Connective, um, like NTXIA or DIA, um, to have that through line and continue that momentum, um, irregardless of, of um, any of those cycles is really important. And then I feel like there was a part two of your question, but I'll pass it off to, to everybody else and jump back in. That's great. Who wants to jump in next? Political support. I'm excited to hear about the Nairobi or Rome with your <laughs> systems. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I, I, I pretty much have a cheat sheet, basically. So I, I've, I've worked in public service. Um, I've advised Africa Union. I, I was full-time uh, senior advisor to the presidency here on data innovation. I am still technical advisor to the presidency. So the, the, the kind of the work that I do basically was, so I'll, 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 I think I'll, I'll, pick, I'll pick up from Jenny. So the first thing I've seen is of course, you need a neutral broker, right? Because it's the extent that, because trust is important and trust is different when, when you're coming from private sector, academia, civil society. Trust is a currency that has to be cultivated across. The second thing you need is a translator. Uh, all these sectors don't speak the same language. Development means different things to, to all these guys. So how do you ensure that you kind of develop a common language? So I agree with Dan around standards. <laughs> standards also include a common language. The third bit, of course, is motivation. Uh, be, be, if, even if you have a champion, the champion has to be motivated. So what's the motivation? Uh, for the champion upstream or downstream. And, and I think the fourth thing, of course, is incentives. And incentives differs, right? So it could be a political incentive, it could be a financial incentive, it could be a merit incentive, you know, it could be a promotional incentive. So how do you ensure that you develop the incentives, but also you align them to the different players? So that's basically has been a model that we've been using and it's been quite su successful. <laughs> I love those easy, you know, those steps that's, you know, what is really going to help the communities on, on this call is, you know, understanding those steps. And I love the idea of a neutral broker, a translator. That's it's terrific. Uh, so, Rafael, over to you in Rome. 
Italy politics. Talk to us. How do you uh, get that political support? Well, I think uh, uh, it's very important to find a way of a real uh, deep cooperation between the political layer and the managerial layer, the technician layer, let's say, or managerial layer. Uh, because uh, it's important to have the, the awareness from the political side that the action in, uh, in the digitalization on in digital policy, let me say, could be a, a real support for the uh, social and economic development in each of the, of the policies that they are in charge of. Uh, this is something that maybe it's quite clear for us, but unfortunately it's not so very um, very, let me say, understood, yes, uh, at the political level, especially uh, when they are engaged to, to some of their specific goal. And the, the idea is that a digital policy is not just uh, um, something uh, in parallel with all the other action, but it's something that can support the, all the um, mandate of the mayor. So this is one basic point for me. And another one for the development in the city is that there is a great need of all the main stakeholders to start to cooperate uh, uh, together. So in another, another word, there is the need uh, that the strategy of the organization start to converge to a single one. That, so the need of share the common vision in the city. Otherwise, it's quite difficult that we can uh, start to plan asset sharing or uh, uh, synergy among the projects uh, if each of us uh, uh, do not uh, and not know uh, which is the 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 near um, the, the the next action uh, in the, in the, in the, on of the neighbor. Let me say so. Uh, a, a common table among the, the main stakeholders is very important. But we also have tried to experience this one, and it's and it's very um, it's very tough at the beginning, but it's uh, it's uh, rewarding after a, a while because uh, as, um, after uh, as soon as you develop some kind of trust and uh, among the, the players, you you feel that. There are very, a lot of opportunities to, to support uh, our uh, single project. So I think this could be really fast in the, the development in the city. Couldn't agree more. It sounds very similar across all these jurisdictions so far. Brian, any, I mean, any additional learnings from the, the Phoenix experience, Phoenix region perspective? I don't know if it'd be any different learnings, but I definitely agree with what everyone's saying. I think the big thing we're kind of circling around is you got to communicate and you have to be able to show up and provide value, right? Mm -hmm. I think the only other thing that I would maybe add is, uh, and expanding on Philip's point of people speaking different languages, is starting to kind of understand the difference between that hard ROI and soft ROI and who cares about what and when they care about what and tying those together. Um, when you're trying to get a project up and off the ground or, or gain support either from the political or staff side and kind of being able to understand, okay, what's important to this person? What actually drives, what motivates them? Um, and it can be either or a mix, um, but just kind of trying to dig in and really trying to understand, okay, what is the value here that we're providing for this person or group, uh, et cetera? Um, and I think if you, you kind of think about it long enough and, and dig hard enough, you can find that in almost any project because I think ultimately most all these projects that we're working on are good, right? They're good things for the community. They improve quality of life. Um, so it's not really something that anyone wants to argue or go against. You just need to be able to make the case and communicate appropriately the value for them as well. 100% agree. And I, Di, that's a good you know example as Brian talks about understanding what's important to the person you're selling to. And as Philip mentioned, translating to universities are completely different beasts than cities. I mean, we had a good example here in the region about how do we sell this to ASU and their executive leadership? Do you want to speak a little bit to that before we move on? Certainly. So I'll start with that question in terms of how did I position the university to our political leaders? And by that, I mean the mayors. So very early in our conversations, it was very clear that the mayors were afraid of the political risk. And by that, I mean the failure of the technology when they deploy in their cities. 
not only because of the obviously media component of that, but also the economic cost of doing so, where it would be taking very limited resources for something that is not going to address the need. So in the conversations of why partnering with ASU in terms of the connective, a lot of my discussion was around the fact that ASU is designed to fail. We fail each and every day because that's what universities do. And that we could actually remove a lot of the political risk. So we could go out, we could test on campus, we could fail, uh, we could then redesign, re-engineer, we could test again and test again. And so that when we came back to them with the technology that was going to address the problem that they had articulated, they had a ready-made tested product that they could then deploy very quickly. And when we're talking about failure and testing, it wasn't only just in terms of the technical engineering component, but when you can bring a university of 85,000 students, including from biostatistics, from the social sciences, that you can actually do some of the testing in terms of how citizens will engage with this, how will they receive it, and you can do it in a real-time monitoring fashion that not only get it provides value to the cities, but it provides value to the university as well. So by removing that risk, the mayors and other elected officials that were engaging with thought that this was an immediate win um, because it took a huge burden off their back. And then going back to the university leadership, and let me assure you, trying to lead this as a law professor at ASU was not the most obvious um, selection of faculty members. And I can assure you that a few of my colleagues in engineering asked that question many times. But how I could frame it to our leadership, one, a lot of the risk here is also the governance risk and thinking through the ordinances and the policies and how do you break down the governance it meant that we in the law school actually really did have a driving seat here and we could actually pull then the other schools together. But for the university, they want to, and ASU in particular, want to be seen to solving the biggest challenges of our region. And so taking on the challenges of our region in this form and then utilizing our campuses provides us with a way of actually talking to our charter and getting our students across the campuses involved in actually addressing that. So we were really lucky at ASU that we have that framework and we have this culture of innovation and working across campuses and across schools. And I think it made it a lot easier to sell to ASU in terms of our leadership to actually deploy resources and to pull together um, people, human capital to actually play in this space. Yeah, fantastic points. Uh, so um, I, I want to save, so we've about 15 minutes left. I want to save a good chunk of uh, time so we can talk about future ideas for collaborating together. But I have to bring up this uh, question that came through a handful of times in the chat so far. It was a, it's a pivot to this question is, okay, political support is one thing, but citizen support is another thing. And a lot of people brought up the, the example of sidewalk labs in Toronto uh, and the failure of really engaging the citizens that are there and how it stopped you know, a very innovative program in its tracks. So uh, does anyone wanna jump in and just talk about the importance of citizen engagement, not only political support, but citizen engagement, citizen support uh, in the future of these initiatives? open call to anyone that wants to really jump in there. I'd be happy to, but you might have to cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> I think and this is probably the social science, you know, the communicator in me, but I think so much of it to the earlier points of storytelling is so important. And I mean that in the sense of how do you make sure and, um, and, and have that translation effect. So, you know, the first community meetings we had, for example, some people showed up and totally got it and were geeked out and were in the space. And some people showed up basically to say, what does this have to do with me? You know, how does this affect my life? And so I think one, being able to articulate, well, first asking the question, listening is most important first, right? I'm not here to come in and tell you what you need. I'm not here to come in and say, you're welcome. I'm solving all your problems when I don't know what those are. And that's particularly important in underserved communities who where the trust has been broken so substantially that you have to really prove that you're there for the right reasons and you really are there to listen to them and you're gonna keep showing up. And so the listening is super important. And then I think saying, okay, given what you've told me, here are the kinds of things that we wanna put into place that will help get to that end game that will solve that problem for you. And here's how, you know, if we do our job right, you won't have any idea that we did these things. You'll just know that your commute was 10 minutes faster, that it took less time to get that permit application through that you didn't have to call four times for the pothole to get filled because, because we already knew and we were able to do predictive maintenance. So 
um, a lot of that is really breaking it down to how does it affect them and making commitments to them. And I talk a lot about this, one of my goals, and maybe we can collaborate on this data bill of rights kind of concept for, for residents and saying, okay, we know you're worried about this. You have reasons to, there's reasons in the news to be worried about our data being sold or used inappropriately or not protected. Here's why we're collecting it. Here's what we're collecting. Here's how it benefits you. Here's how we protect it. Here's how we will never use that data. And so how can we come together and build the trust from that standpoint? Um, and I would love to see kind of the universal ways that we use data for good, you know, and there's some organizations working on that. So um, convene, listen, make a commitment, translate it to how it helps their lives, and then go from there. But yeah. You didn't have it. to cut me off, but you should have. No, it was perfect. Philip, jump okay. in. I think you got something to add. If, 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 so for four points uh, in, in terms of experience. One, I think is re it's recognizing uh, uh, community structures, re recognizing how communities are organized. So not trying to create new ones and, and seeing how you plug into that. We found that was quite important. The second bit of course is, um, is, is, is sort of, is not trying to, to replace any local ecosystems, right? Recognize leadership, but also not trying to, to replace anything. Uh, because then you recognize local knowledge and, and the experiences. The third piece, of course, is how do you add value to that? Uh, and, and then I think that the fourth piece then is co-creation. Mm -hmm. Once you set up those, we've realized that's, that's quite important because then the fifth piece is then, is your resiliency? Will you stay longer or are you a touch and go, right? So, so that's, uh, I, I would think the, those are the five things we've seen that are quite effective. Yeah, I think all incredibly valid and invaluable points. I, I love this idea you know, there's a lot of common theme around this idea of listening and co-creating and working together, but then also telling the story. I, I think that's what's so fascinating about these last three days. This is our first time combining our Smart Region Summit with the Shaping EDU organization, which is, uh, I believe, an organization of educators and learners. And the way they've been able to bring this kind of storytelling through the winter games theme throughout, or to a lot of local government people, I thought it, I think it's opened our eyes as a new way to engage with each other. We don't have to be so serious all the time. We can tell good stories and how we're building smart cities, smart regions through a theme of winter games and participating with people from around the world. So I'm loving this idea of listening and, and storytelling, uh, and then adding you know positive value. This is terrific. Okay, so now now's the fun time. Let's put on our, our ideation caps. I think we've got a good 10 minutes left here. Um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, regions from around the world here. You know, we all, as you can tell, come together for the intention of wanting to collaborate. You know, moving forward into 2021, how might our regions better collaborate together, better build this kind of ideal global network of smart regions that's really helping drive this uh, movement, not only in our local ecosystems that might already kind of believe in it and are engaged in it, but also help to bring on other regions that, that might not quite be there, but by combining and joining with us, we can help accelerate their, their development uh, into smart regions and help them cultivate their own ecosystem. So I know this is a little bit of a, a broad call out, um, but let's, let's really start to think about what might be some ways that we can collaborate here in, in, in 2021. And Jen, no pressure. Uh, because I know we've talked about this offline quite a handful of times. So, you, you know, what's coming to your mind uh, in, in ways we might be able to work together on a more structured basis, I would say. Mm. So, yeah, the 2021, the year of domination. That's what, that's what we're all talking about, and domination through collaboration, right? And so I think, um, so one thing that immediately comes to mind for me that in this, so one of the questions I would get from bigger cities in building NTXIA, right, was like, well, we're already at this level, right? So what, what is the benefit of us to being part of this organization when we've got you know, X, Y, and Z small towns? And I said, well, one, it's gonna support everybody, but two, what we want is for cities that are a little further along to be able to pull the newer folks up beside them. And so I think this mentor mentee kind of concept has been informal, but I think we can create sister city, sister town, sister region relationships um, and, and really be able to lift each other up and pull each other along and, and to the point of similar to when I always say, I always bring in kids when I need new ideas, like let's do a focus group with elementary, middle and high schoolers. Um, when you have different size towns and different towns from around the world, I'm gonna hear things, I'm gonna get ideas that I never, ever, ever would have come up with. And so I think formalizing almost a sister city region 
mentor mentee kind of network um, would be a really great uh, place to start. But I but I do think it it follows kind of how we've all built our ecosystems and then and then just expanding it up. What are the priorities that we all see regardless of geography? Let's pick one, right? Let's pick one and let's do that project and prove out how we can solve and what makes sense um, in, in each of our jurisdictions and what problems pop up as a result, which leads to the process and procedure and standards conversations and where the commonalities and where, yeah, you could all laugh at me. Di, you and I are gonna have a multi-part series on this later, but- um, Sounds but like I, a book a three day trip on this. I, I like it. I'm ready, let's go. That's great. I love the idea of, uh, you know, kind of formalizing, a, you know, a, a smart region sister city network. Interesting enough, I, I hear we're, we're kind of seeing a transformation of sister city programs, right? They were built way back in the day, obviously to exchange this kind of political goodwill, but now they're all looking to justify their kind of existence. And this could be a way uh, we can kind of pivot those organizations to help build a smart region network potentially. Rafael, any any ideas from Italy? I mean, you, you've you already built kind of one smart region down in the Brescia uh, region, and now you're kind of trying to do it again in the Rome region. You know, what do you think might be some tangible benefits from joining this kind of larger network? Well, I think that we could also try to uh, take advantage of uh, existing uh, other uh, subnet, let me say, of cities. For example, in Rome, we are working together with the city of Florence, Milan, Venice, Turin. And uh, each of us probably already knows which are the main current projects or area of interest of those cities. So each of us could also play as a inter inter intermediate nodes with the other maybe uh, international networks. And this could help to interconnect maybe, let me say, oh, I already know that Phoenix is working on this subject. I could put in touch that city with Florence because as far as I know, uh, they are still uh, already interested in the same uh, topic. So we could try to take, to take advantage of uh, the uh, networks that we have on, on our, in our country and to put uh, uh, in touch some of our uh, mate, <laughs> city mates uh, to other, uh, to the city of the other international networks. So that in the end, uh, we, we could have a wider network, but still with uh, small groups that, uh, as we know, are more affordable uh, in terms of, uh, of, um, of uh, intensity of uh, relationship. Yeah, or management. I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, you know, it kind of makes me think to float an idea out to Raphael's point. I mean, this year we held this, you know, Winter Games kind of smart region conference. We tried to go global with it. And by that aspect, we met, you know, do you mind staying up till 12 a.m., 2 a.m. to join us for a panel here? But there's no reason why next year we could host this event and Italy could be hosting its own handful of programming with your local networks. And we're tuning in. Uh, when we can, and you know, Philip in Nairobi, your host, it's that kind of that sub networks, but these, this could be going on all across the continent. So if I, you know, city manager, but I like the idea of what the, you know, conference or the panel Florence is hosting, you know, I can stay up late and, and host it. But then that's that, I think, you know, so many different events happening all over the world under that common theme of whatever we come up with smart regions, if, if that's what it is. I, I just love that idea of not having it kind of time zone focus with Arizona, but next year really expanding that net, allowing, you know, Jen in Dallas to host her events when she wants to host it, Raphael in Rome to host their events when they want to host it, but we can all tune in and participate uh, as we go. I think that's a kind of an interesting idea of how we take what we did this year and build on it. Philip, any ideas from your, your perspective as you, you're actually kind of doing what I think Raphael just mentioned of building out these centers of excellence, these nodes. Uh, talk to us about some ideas you might have. No, sure. But I, I, I think, again, I'm looking at, at, at kind of four, four parts of this from this discussion. Um, one, of course, is I agree with, uh, of course, Jennifer, again, in terms of this sister, I don't want to call it sister series, seems to be a UN habitat language. I, I'm looking at a system of systems, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at how do you build this system of systems, uh, of, 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 of cities, smart cities, smart regions, smart villages, you know, something that that creates a commonality, 
I, I think I'm, I'm super excited about that. Uh, potentially, it could be a global partnership of this. Uh, of course, uh, Dai would know Sanjeev, but my dean is, is a guru in, in, in global partnerships. So, so potentially a global partnership of smart cities or sister cities. The second piece, of course, is, is a very practical aspect of a knowledge network. I think clearly that's what the, the, the games have shown that is important to ensure that uh, knowledge is proactively shared. Panels are fine, but I think if we create a capability that people can share knowledge proactively, I think that's important. The third bit, of course, is this whole area of standards and principles. And I think we've discussed this a lot, uh, issues of values. Uh, you're talking about governance, you're talking about transparency, you're talking about engaging citizens and inclusivity, you're talking about digital inclusion. We're talking about recognizing diversity, even, even in our inclusivity. So potentially, how do we work on those like standards and principles so that uh, somebody knows uh, in that network, when we're talking about this, then it's something that everybody understands. And, and that becomes attractive, I think, for everybody to join in because then we can aspire towards a higher ideal. So it's just not a, a collaborative for nothing. The fourth bit, I think, is this, this concept of quick wins. Um, the only thing that gels groups and makes us uh, understand each other more is if we decide to work on something. So can we think through uh, what is it that you can work collaboratively? Something that potentially has is common across a couple of these regions and then how can we improve and make that better uh, and then in a year's time if Raphael or myself is doing something then we have something to show mm -hmm. yeah completely yeah no, I'm loving these ideas uh, die anything from the kind of I love the knowledge network this idea of finding key issues standards principles I mean procurement you know whatever might be those challenges that we can all work together as we try to solve these and then share that share that knowledge and then the quick wins is perfect I, education, anything from kind of your education hat. First, I'm going to make an observation. I've never sat on a panel where people agree with each other so much. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is groundbreaking for me. Yeah. So it, there's an area that we didn't get to talk about, and that is about educating the workforce. And I think in terms of all of our regions, there's a real need to think about and level set in terms of what is it that those people who are sitting in government and trying to deploy some of these technologies and solutions, what is it that they need to better do their job and how can we better serve them? And I'm channeling my colleague, Erin Carr Jordan, who had to unfortunately leave. And I'm thinking about the phenomenal online platform that ASU has through Ed Plus and then Thunderbird and Executive Education. And one of the things I think we could do is what is it around our regions in the world that the workforce need and start to develop modules that are available at low cost or free, that are available on demand, that actually start to address some of those challenges. Because if we can raise that baseline and educate that workforce, and these are people who are struggling to do their job and demands and don't necessarily have capacity to attend formal colleges or attend executive education programs, so what about we do something collectively? And yes, there's going to be differences in each of our regions and we can have the nuances and tailor it, but we have the expertise on this panel. We know what it is that we need in the region. And by bringing in the experts for each of these regions and tailoring it, I think we could deliver some phenomenal content that will go a long way to really driving what a smart region is. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, education is universal. And it's interesting, as I mentioned, we're bringing in, you know, this whole organization that's focused on educators and learners in this conference. And you'd be surprised at the panels earlier uh, this week, how there were a lot of students participating in these smart cities and saying, how do I get involved? You know, impacting the community sounds interesting to me. How, how do I, you know, do this? How do I engage with my city in that? And you're right. I, I think the workforce, the next generation workforce pipeline is something that I hear almost every city talk about, no matter where in the world they are. It's a key issue. So I think it could be something to rally around. And, and Brian, I don't know if you want to speak to, you know, some of the things we've been looking at about workforce uh, with the community college district, leveraging them as well. But, you know, this is obviously an issue for Greater Phoenix. And is, it, is this something you can jump on as well? Or you think the region could jump in as well? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a, you know, workforce development is a key kind of critical factor for, for all of these, these initiatives that we're engaging in, right? Um, and we are lucky that we have some great partners here in, in our region uh, with ASU and the Maricopa Community College District um, who also even work well together, which is not always the same, you know, not, not always the case um, and have really kind of 
identified their roles and understood and, and, and kind of what they bring to the table, what their comparative advantages are or disadvantages are, uh, you know, compared to each other uh, and different uh, kind of communities across our region. And I think, you know, kind of understanding that and almost, and almost kind of figuring out like almost like a profile of a city, right? What are we good at? What are we not so good at? Um, what is Dallas good at? What are they not so good at? And then we could almost kind of match make, right? And figure out, okay, there's a, there's a potential project or we see a lot of these big kind of federal grants initiatives that could we, could we develop or identify a project that it makes sense that, you know, Dallas is able to work on this part and Phoenix brings this value by working on this part, but ultimately we're better off together and actually develop some more, uh, more comprehensive uh, kind of solutions uh, as we go. So if we could kind of start to think together and, and maybe even develop some of that framework and just really understand ourselves and then each other. And then we get, it's really just fitting puzzle pieces together at that point, in my mind. I know I make it sound a lot more simple than it is, but you know, someday it will be. <laughs> no, I, Brian, I think you put it perfectly. And, and that's a perfect way to wrap up. I feel like we could continue uh, talking about this for hours and hours with this group. But I think you hit on the, the nail on the head on something that I just maybe want to close with. It's this, we've seen this a lot in the federal grants here in America, this idea of the replicability of projects. They want to see you prove that what you're building or what you're working on can be adopted and replicated in another city, right? And so I think what we're touching on here with this potential collaboration of a smart region network is this idea of not just a think tank, but this network of do tanks, Brian, you just hit, you just nailed it. You know, don't, don't just talk about it. And Philip, I think you said it, don't just collaborate for collaboration's sake, but collaborate to do something and make an impact. And so I, I've been feverishly taking notes. I think we might have uh, the foundation or the, for something, you know, this network, uh, this sister city-like network uh, of smart regions that we can really build on and show value. Again, identify what we want to work on uh, and then show value for why, we, for why we're doing it. So I just want to thank all of you again for being, one, such fabulous friends, and two, being able to participate in this event at the, you know, 2 a.m. at midnight. Thank you both. Jan from Dallas, always thank you. It's always fun joining you. Uh, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your partnership and we look forward to doing something great together. Love it. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot, everyone. Oh, thank, you thank you for the invitation. Greetings to all of you. <laughs> Bye. Bye.